coming from Matthew's the 13th chapter, verses 24 to 30, and Ephesians 5, 14. Matthew's 13, 24 to 30, and Ephesians 5, 14. And it reads, another parable he put forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, did not thou sow good seed in the field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, least while you gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Ephesians 5, 14, wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepeth and arise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light. Would you say my subject with me? And it simply says, wake up. Uh, just say that again. Come on real loud. Say, wake up. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah to his name. Thank you, Jesus. We bless him, his name. We thank God uh, for his presence in the house. When we study the ministry of Jesus, one thing among many we observe is the fact that he spent a lot of his time teaching his disciples about the principles of the kingdom of God. Somebody say kingdom. Uh, one of the phrases that we read in the Bible over and over is, and he sat down and taught the people. John, the eighth chapter, uh, says early in the morning, uh, Jesus goes to the house of God and all the people came to him. And the scripture says, and he sat down and taught them. Luke, the fifth chapter, once again, says that while Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, many people pushed just to get near him because they wanted so badly to hear the word of God. And Jesus sees two boats, uh, and he gets into one of them, one uh, which was Simon, and he tells Simon to launch out just a little bit. And then the scripture says, and then he sat down, and he taught the people from the boat. And so the objective of Jesus' teaching was to give hearers the ability to learn new information and implement what they heard so we could conclude that teaching is paramount. Teaching is important. Uh, it, it is that we enjoy preaching and we enjoy the, the, the music and the Hammond organ, but uh, teaching is necessary and it is paramount. But the one thing that we must understand is that teaching by itself does not bring change. 
Teaching, if it is uh, isolated, does not bring change. What teaching brings to the table is knowledge. Knowledge, then, is the accumulation of information. All of our young people, many of them are going to college, and uh, when you go to college, you're going to sit in a classroom, and you're going to listen to lectures. You're going to listen to classroom time. The teacher is doing what? Giving you information information. Somebody say amen. Uh, uh, that's the accumulation of information. The knowledge uh, must graduate to understanding because you need to know something and then you need to understand that something. And then understanding then has to graduate to comprehending and understanding and interpreting that information. But I love the last part, and that is wisdom. Wisdom now gives you godly insight. It gives you divine insight to implement what you know and what you understand. Let me say that again. Wisdom gives you the ability to know what you know, understand what you understand, and then implement those things at the right time. This is why the Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. Somebody, are you following me? Wisdom is the principal thing uh, uh, because those things you got to know what to do and know why you are doing it and then wisdom shows you how to get it done. Somebody say amen. amen. For the Lord, Proverbs says, for the Lord gives wisdom and from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. This is why uh, the teaching ministry of Jesus Christ was so vitally important for if the disciples was going to continue the ministry of Jesus, they had to be given the capacity to know what Jesus knew, to understand what he understood, and to do what Jesus was doing. And with all that knowledge, wisdom gave them. But what, what is the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of God? And not only that, the, the, the teachings of Christ about the kingdom uh, applies to all of us today. The same principle applies to us today. The message this morning is not a youth message. The message this morning is not an adult message. It is a universal message. The same word that applies to the adults applies to the youth. The same teachings that Jesus taught the disciples, that same word applies to you and I today. But we've got to study it. Tell somebody, study, study. You've got to study it. Uh, Jesus' preferable teaching style was in parabolic form, putting into focus the natural and the spiritual so that people could understand what the kingdom was about. But again, what is the kingdom? The kingdom of God, the Bible says, is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of what? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Let's say that the, again, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of what? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God defined in the simplest terms means God's rule and reign on this earth. It is the rule and the reign of God. God reign involves God's intentions his authority, and his ruling power. The kingdom of God is God's reign. It's not about you. Somebody tell your neighbor, it's not about you. It's not about uh, how good you have and your gifts are. It's not about what you are wearing. It's not about the position that you hold, but it's all about the kingdom of God. That which we do, we do so that God may get the glory. God's reign involves his intentions. It's not yours and our intentions. It involves his authority. I understand 
that the highest court in our land is the Supreme Court, who houses nine judges dressed in black robes, four women, one being an African-American woman named Kentanji Brown Jackson. But I want you to understand uh, this morning that in God's kingdom, there is only one judge. Hallelujah to his name. And John tells us that he's called faithful and true. He says his eyes are like a flame of fire. And I want you to know as John looked upon him, he didn't have on a black robe, but the scripture says his garment was dipped in blood and out of his mouth was a two-edged sword. And on his thigh was written, King of kings and Lord of lords. God's kingdom cannot be stopped. It cannot be defeated. It cannot be frustrated or overtaken or overruled. And of his kingdom, the Bible says, there shall be what? No end. I'm so glad that I'm in a victorious kingdom. Hallelujah to the name of the Lord. I am in, a, I don't know about you, but I am in the kingdom of God. Is there anybody in the kingdom? Hallelujah. I am in the kingdom of God. Yes, his disciples had to learn how God's kingdom operated. And so Jesus uses another phrase in his teaching, which brings us this morning to the text. He says, the kingdom is like unto this. It is likened, King James uses, the kingdom of God is likened. Uh, meaning that the kingdom of God is like this. It is not this, but it operates like this. That's why we have to pay attention to these parables. He says the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Now, the first thing we notice right from the outset is two things, the seed and ground or field. Any farmer understands that when you plow your field, you have to make sure that the ground is prepared for the seed. You've got to take out all the rocks. You've got to take out all the stones so that the seed can be fruitful. The seed itself already comes prepackaged for increase. Everything that the seed needs is inside. But the one thing that it needs is a ground that is ready and prepared to receive it. The scripture says that this, this man, he sowed a seed into ground. The ground was ready, and he understood that the seed was already prepackaged for increase. He was expecting a harvest. Let's shift gears real quickly to the spiritual. The seed is the word. And the word has already came prepackaged for increase. But the problem comes is with the ground or the heart of man. Uh, because sometimes we come to church with the mindset of entertainment. Sometimes we come to church to look at one another and to look at what you have on and, and to oppress one another with our clothing. But that does not guarantee that you're going to get what God has for you. Your heart has to be prepared, not when you come into God's sanctuary, but the Bible says enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Before you wake up and when you open up your eyes, you ought to say, Lord, I give you the glory. I give you the praise for what you have done for me. You can't wait until you get here to start praising the Lord because that's not true praise. Praise happens when nobody is looking. Praise happens when there is no organ to pump you up. 
praise happens when there is no preacher preaching the word because the word of God is on the inside. Somebody give him a, a praise. Hey, hallelujah. Come on, come on, that's not everybody. Some of you just still looking, you're still looking, you're still looking. The question is, is your ground prepared for worship? Hey, and to receive what God has for you. Come on, clap your hands and give God a praise. Holy Ghost, we thank you this morning. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. He's worthy. The seed, the seed, yes, yes, yes. The farmer understood that, that, that the seed, he was to get a, a harvest out of the seed. But, but as I read the text and I continued on, Jesus, he gives the explanation of the parable in verse, verses 37 through 40. But Bishop, I couldn't get away from the next verse. But while men slept. But while men slept, something happened. He says, the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. It messed me up because it showed me the, the, the destruction of the enemy. Here it was that this farmer sowed a seed and expected a harvest, and while they were sleeping, an enemy came under the cover of night, and he had a destructive seed. Now, this destructive seed looks exactly like the good seed. <laughs> Glory to the name. But, but, but what people don't know about the seed is that that seed that the enemy sows is destructive and poisonous. It may look good at first sight. That boy or that girl may look pretty and handsome at first sight. Glory to the name of the Lord. You don't see it at first, but this is what happened. Nobody noticed the destructive seed because the seeds were working underground. The seed had a root system that were working, and, and those individuals never even noticed it until they both grew and they began to produce fruit. And then the servants looked on the field when the wheat and the tares began to produce fruit, they looked on the, and said, wait a minute, what is this that we see? Didn't you sow good seed? Why is there bad seed in the field? Well, I submit to you that the enemy right now to some of us is sowing destructive seed that we have not noticed yet. And we haven't noticed it because we are sleeping. We, 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 we don't understand and we don't see, we don't notice that we're sleeping because we have not been awakened by God. But, but we don't even know that our children in our homes are struggling with suicidal thoughts. Uh, we don't even realize that our children are being destructive and they're carrying guns in the streets. We don't even notice that even in the church, there are individuals that are pointing fingers and, and being bitter against one another. I want you to know that you are sleeping. But God is calling for the church to wake up. You've got to wake up. Lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily beset you. And the scripture says, and run this race with patience, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Somebody say, wake up. Yeah. Hallelujah to his name. We don't even realize in many cases that we are asleep. When we look into the news and into the newspapers, every single day, we see shootings in our street. And to some of us, those things has desensitized us. The only thing that we can say is, oh, what a shame. 
But God wants those things to break our hearts. Because when it breaks our hearts, that is when we will cause change to happen through prayer and through fasting and through seeking God and seeking his will. God is calling us to wake up. As I began to think on these things, I said, I don't want God to be asleep. Anytime that I preach a message, I don't just preach it to you. I, it comes to me first and say, Lord, I don't want to be asleep at this critical time. The Bible says that we ought to be looking up for our redemption is drawing nigh. But many of us don't even realize or think about the fact that Jesus could come today. He could come in the next minute. The question is, are you ready to meet him? Are you ready to meet him? I began to think about in the scriptures the five foolish and the five wise versions. And the Bible says that while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, hallelujah. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. And then the scripture says, then all those virgins, they arose and they began to trim their lambs. I thought to myself, in the, our 21st century, I said the five foolish, they got up. And when they got up, they dusted themselves off. And then they picked up their cell phones. And when they picked up their cell phones, they hit the Facebook icon and began to scroll through all of their likes. And when they uh, finished Facebook, they went to Instagram and they began to look at all of the video feeds. And when they finished there, they went to TikTok and they began to look at all the TikTok dances. In fact, they said, oh, let's do a TikTok dance ourselves. After they was finished with TikTok, they looked around at their lamps and they realized that their lamps had gone out. And when they looked again, they looked and saw that they did not have any more oil. But then they realized in their minds that there were five wise versions. These versions understood that prayer is the key to the kingdom. Hallelujah. These versions understood that they needed to get down on their knees and seek God for change. And so the wise said, we know what we're going to do. Let's ask the wise. Let's ask the wise. And the wise told the foolish, no, no, no. you got to get it for yourself. You've got to get the Holy Ghost for yourself. You've got to get joy for yourself. God says in his word, for the spirit of heaviness put on the garment of praise. You've got to learn how to praise them through all trials. Somebody give God a praise. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. And the Bible says uh, that they went, the five foolish went out, um, and they went and searched and tried to buy the oil. And when they came, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went into the marriage, uh, and the door was shut. And then the foolish came, and, and they said, Lord, open to us. But Jesus said, I know you not. Lord, I don't want to be a foolish virgin. But I want to be a wise virgin. Is there anybody in the house uh, that want to serve God, um, that want to see God, um, that want to see him move? Uh, come on, stand to your feet and give God a praise. Um, give him a praise. Um, give him a praise. Um, praise him uh, in the firmament uh, of his people. Um, praise him. Uh, give him glory for he has been good. He has done wonderful things. The songwriter said, when I think of the goodness of Jesus, and oh, somebody say, oh, he's done for me. My soul cries out. Somebody say, hallelujah, hallelujah, 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank God for saving me. Glory to the name of the Lord. God is calling. He's calling for us to wake up. To lay aside those things that are hindering us. He's calling for commitment. He's calling for a change. Not for us to look at our neighbor, a point to that person, this person, or that person. But God is saying, you need to say, Lord is me. Hallelujah. Standing in the need of prayer. I need to pray for my child. I need to get a prayer through. The old mothers knew how to get a prayer through. Hallelujah. To get down on the altar and say, Lord, I need you. Some of us today are struggling financially. Somebody got a bad report. But God is saying, all you've got to do is wake up. Because the answer is right there in front of you. Hallelujah. Change has come, but we need to recognize where God is calling us. This is Bishop J. Lewis Felton thanking you for joining us for the Mount Airy Kingdom Worship Experience. May you continue to partner with us as we share the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world. We love you in Jesus' name.